Welcome back to Elden Ring, the Ultimate Guide, Part 28. Today, it is Altus Plateau, but the inner wall of Altus Plateau before Lindell. Now, if this is the first time you've watched any of these guides, then we recommend you watch the video linked in the description. But otherwise, we are warping to capital outskirts that we got in the first um, Altus Plateau uh, video, or be second Altus Plateau video, actually. And now we are just heading south to this little encampment. Now, we're going to get prepped because there is... Another ulcerated tree spirit, except this one isn't technically a boss. But the cool thing is, is that we can at least prep ourselves outside the camp and then um, head into the camp and then kick it shit in. But this one is fairly important because it does drop a golden seed, I think. So it's worthwhile doing. If you wanted to massively over prepare for this, you could have put Flaming Strike on because that would be doing absolutely crazy damage to this thing. Yeah, Flaming um, Strike, good. Um, I get a, a Blood Flame Blade Wild Strike's probably quite decent. Um, probably insanely good if you can, like, you know, um, knock it down. So you could probably, like, maybe spam a few Lion's Claws at it, get it into this state, and then just uh, Blood Flame Blade Wild Strike's would absolutely take care of it. The thing is, though, is that because of the, um, the Great Stars are just so fucking good, just jumping L1s is just good enough, honestly. Bleeding it and frosting it, knocking it down. There's really, as long as you're avoiding that attack there, where it swishes away and then lunges at you, because that's the grab attack, you're really just not going to have a problem. Um, but if you are having a problem, Flame and Strike or Blood Flame Blade plus Wild Strikes is great options also. I'm in the back of this carriage of the Giants Crusher. Um, yes. It's a colossal weapon. It is infusible. It is the highest strength requirement weapon in the game. It's also the heaviest weapon in the game, but for a pure strength build, uh, you really can't go wrong. It's charged R2 is unique. It gives you a little front flip. It's basically like a mini lion's claw. Um, it hits extraordinarily hard, especially if you pair it with Royal Knight's Resolve that we picked up in the last episode, which boosts your next attack's damage by... Uh, 80% for one hit. So you can Royal Knight's Resolve, fully charged R2, and you will pretty much one-shot anything smaller than a boss. So here we are, and this is the only, or at least one of the few times in the games where we have to speak to Melania. Um, not Melania, Melina. And the reason for this is because she gives you the outer order gesture. So speak to her and get the gesture. Now, I think we picked up a sacred tier, I think. No, this no. is the one of the few churches that doesn't have one. What we picked up was the Golden Order Seal. It that is was the it. best casting seal for a hybrid faith intelligence build, and it boosts the Golden Order incantation. So things like your Discus of Light, Triple Rings of Light, things to that effect. Um, it's actually quite a fun build. It's not super effective because a lot of enemies in this game resist holy damage heavily. Um... But for the enemies where you can make it work, the ones that are vulnerable to it, like the Deathbirds, it is unparalleled. It's really, really strong. So we've got our dagger with Storm Stomp out to make killing these invisible scarabs easy. And we get Prayerful Strike from this scarab. Now, this is an Ash of War that we are, in fact, going to use extensively uh, throughout the um, second portion of the game. Uh, or at least, uh, we don't start using it until a little bit later on, but... Putting one of these things on your great stars is fan-fucking-tastic because it is a giant bonk hit, so it does respectful damage. But the thing is, is it heals you basically to full um, if it connects. So what this ends up meaning is that some enemies just literally can't kill you through Prayerful Strike. So you can just spam Prayerful Strike at certain enemies and that's the strategy because you, they actually just can... basically just can't kill you through it. So... We are heading into uh, this particular uh, tunnel is very important uh, because we get the probably the most important bell bearing in the game. Uh, and this will allow us to upgrade our um, great stars to where they should be once we do this one. And then our damage increase is just going to be really crazy from this point onwards. So we picked up a special stone 5 and we're just jumping i mean just the great stars is just so good we just jump in l1 everything to death it's really fantastic i was just gonna say actually that you'll notice we're now no longer having to um rely on ashes of war to take out the miners and that's because the great stars 
deal striking damage. Um, yet another benefit of the Great Stars. Make sure to jump over this branch, by the way, because if you don't, it's hard to grab that item. Yeah. Now, before we knocked, uh, knocked through that in, uh, like, illusory wall, we picked up the uh, Smith & Stone Miner's Bell Bearing number two, and that is going to get us, if we give that to the Twin Maiden Husks in the Round Table Hold, she will then st uh, sell uh, threes and four level Smith & Stones. I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a result, that will allow us to upgrade our great stars. Uh, now, we're going to just use the bow here, take care of these... Um... I'm not actually sure what those enemies are. They're Volga Militiamen. I thought it was Volga of, can... Yeah, they can drop their full armor set, the helmet, the armor, the gauntlets, the greaves, and the Volga Militia Shotel if they're wielding it, or the Volga Militia Saw if they are wielding it. Indeed. Well remembered. Thanks, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, just kind of follow the path that we're taking. Um, no, no, not only that, there was uh, miners that we. Uh, so the miners, uh, as we've said before, they can drop the pickaxe and then a whole bunch of either explosive stones, explosive stone clumps, poison stone, poison stone clumps. And uh, the ones in this tunnel specifically are the only ones that drop poison stones and poison stone clumps. Uh, although quickly, uh, before I continue on with that. When you drop down here, uh, you have to bait the uh, Abductor Virgin over here, get to use its attack, and that will break the stone in half, allowing you to get the juicy innards. Although we just got sucked into that thing's juicy innards. So try and avoid the grab attack. That. You beat me to the joke and I'm so annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try and not let happen what's happening right now. Once it's broken the statue, try and get out from behind it. And then I don't even think it broke the it. fucking statue. Yeah, it did. It did. Cool. Yeah. And that's as we get a Smith and Stone 6. Times 3, so that's actually worth it. Ugh, but as you can see, it is a pain in the ass. <laughs> do we actually fight this, or do we just grab the items and bolt? I don't think we fight it. Now, the miners can also drop, aside from... Uh, Poison stones and poison stone clubs. They drop very smith and stones. So I guess you can, like, I don't know, farm them or something if you want. Gravel stones and uh, cracked crystals, but those are the only ones that the cracked crystals drop from the miners that have the, the, the glowing rocks in the backpacks. But otherwise, kind of back thumb. over the beaten path, I guess. It's kind of a rule of thumb generally that if they have the green rocks in the backpack, they can drop the poison clumps. Blue, they can drop the. Uh... Crack crystals. Crack crystals and red, they can drop the explosive stones. Now, these little piles here, we've encountered them before. They are the Everjail Watchers. I just want to make a point. Um, we just picked up a Smith and Stone 5 that didn't look very obvious on screen, and you might miss it, but yeah, we picked up a Smith and Stone 5 that was like right at that back wall. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, these watchers, as you're seeing on screen, will explode if you get near them. And it does a pretty meaty chunk of damage, so if you're worried about taking that damage, just try and trigger them from a distance and get out of their range. Um, you can roll through it, as you just saw there, but your best bet is to sort of trigger them at their max range and then get out of the AoE. Well, that's Smith and Stone 5 there. And now we're just descending. I think we're just heading to the boss, which... <sighs> What's the boss for this area? Um, I want to say it's an Onyx Lord, but it might be an Alabaster Lord. I think it's the Onyx Lord, though. Oh, shit, it actually is. I actually do remember the, the boss for this. And this is pretty much one of the easiest bosses in the game, to the point where I'm not telling you how to beat it. If you can't I mean, they... beat this, there's something wrong with you. It is hilariously easy. Old men in underwear has not been a threat since Limgrave. Wasn't um, even a threat in Limgrave. No, exactly, and continues to not be a threat. <laughs> That's me just showing off. Breaking its, strike. Yeah. yeah, breaking its stance in two hits. Um, does very good stance damage, as we've said. Heals you for, I think, 30% of your HP. So as long as the attack that you trade with doesn't heal 30%, you take no damage. 
Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, now, bear in mind that the Great Stars gives you back 1% of your HP per hit. So if you're using the Jump and L1 attacks, you'll get 2% of your HP back per hit or per jump attack. Now, this also applies to the Mimic tier, which is also why the Great Stars are so good because it massively increases the survivability of your Mimic tier. But if you have Prayerful Strike on your right hand um, Great Stars, the Mimic tier will also use Prayerful Strike and thus regen all its health back up to full. So we are giving the uh, Twin Main Husk all the Bell Bairns that we own and we are getting uh, 12 Smith and Stone 3s and 12 Smith and Stone 4s. And now we're going to head to Hugh, and now we're going to get a huge bump in damage because now we can actually upgrade our Great Stars to something substantial. Yeah, six levels. Um, you'll notice the door beside the Twin Maiden Husks was open. In there is the Phantom of the Dung Eater. Now, we have one of the items required for his quest, so we could be progressing that now, and we do in this episode, I believe. Um, a little bit of a weird edit there. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. I was just... Uh, there's clearly two bits of footage. What the fuck is going on here? I haven't the faintest clue. I didn't edit this. <laughs> Fuck it. Upgrade the Great Stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah upgrade them a lot, apparently. <laughs> yeah. So, now, it's pretty much imperative that you want to get that as early as possible. You very much, and this, I didn't want to say it at the time, but if this is, say you're in Altus Plateau number two, so you've just beaten the the uh, tree sentinels, it's actually not a terrible idea going into that tunnel and uh, getting the smith and stone bell baron at that point in the game. The reason why we don't is because we don't want to put the, the videos out of order, but strictly speaking it's, it, it is suggested that you in fact go there and do that early. Um, quite a bit early as well. That's like three areas. Three or four areas actually that you'd have your great stars be upgraded. Not that you need it, to be fair. The Great Stars are great exactly where they were. Uh, so when it comes to these guys, uh, these bosses are some of the most annoying in the game. But oddly enough, the Great Stars makes them pretty good. The Gargoyles. Um, we've already fought the double Gargoyle boss at the bottom of SEO for Aqueduct. Again, you could have waited until this point to do that boss. Because when we, when we fought it, it is disproportionately difficult. But with the Great Stars, you're going to have a much easier time. Because as you saw there, you can just spam jumping L1s at that thing, and that was enough to kill it easily. So, so get Grabbing two gold seeds. Gold. Yeah, another two golden seeds. Another reason the, the uh, Great Stars are so good against the Gargoyles specifically is because their lowest damage resistance, much like the Miners, is in fact blunt damage. Now here, you're seeing a trick that I really like. That doesn't um, work. But it sort of that works. That didn't work. So... For some reason that didn't work you have to get closer and then use a kukri basically the, there's a damage drop off over distance i suppose so if you're close enough you can just use a kukri to kill the 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 teleporting scarabs yeah and you got golden parry for that golden parry is i would argue the second or third the best parry tool you have in the game uh the golden parry is kind of unique in that it can parry from a range it extends the range of a parry as well as the active parry frames. So you have a bigger window to land your parry and you also have a bigger AoE to land the parry. It's pretty cool. So heading north-east-ish uh, up here. Uh, okay, it's just some wandering nobles. At this point, we've spoken enough, I think, about the what the... They're not even wandering nobles. They're just commoners, I think, actually. No, they were wandering nobles. The one you killed was a treasury noble. Hence oh, the big golden yes. rune drop. You are right, you are right. So that one specifically, kill that one that's holding the box, because it will drop a big rune. Um, Making our way to the next site of grace, I believe. And there's a couple of items to pick up around it. That golden yes. rune. Yes. And then I think we'll be bumping into an old friend. Yes, so for whatever reason... We're now about to fight Margit again. However, so, strictly speaking, uh, get your Margit Shackle out for this. But given our build and given what Margit is like, 
we are so impossibly over equipped for Margit, it's actually just kind of funny. Because going Margit Shackle into jumping L1 spam is just. just fucking game over. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally nothing that this that, that this particular strategy can't take care of, to be honest. So there's Margit, and I don't even I partly don't even get the shackle out. I think I must have forgotten about it. It just don't it just doesn't matter. I mean, whether you forgot or not, yeah, like you said, it really doesn't matter. Jumping L1 with the Great Stars is a problem solver, and we are fighting a big ugly problem. Now, to, um, uh, bear in mind, again, we have Ground Slam on as our Ash of War. Lion's Claw, as we've said before, would be insanely good in this situation. Uh, Lion's Claw would be, is, would be fucking fantastic against Margit. But again, Ground Slam also good. If it was good then, it'll be good now. But aye, as, as you can see, we got in a prayerful strike. That managed to get our health back. Don't be... You can get a little bit cocky with prayerful strike. Don't get too greedy with it because things can kill you if they hit you fast enough through the animation. Because you could be knocked out of Prayerful Strike, unlike Lion's Claw. I mean, I suppose they had to nerf it somehow. Yeah. Because if, yeah, if it had the chuffing damage resistance of Lion's Claw, like, it would be, without question, the best Sash War in the game. Yeah, definitely. 100%. <laughs> so, there's Margit. Yeah, you can get the Shackle out. You can... Um... Just jumping L1 it to death, I guess. Uh, you could also, in theory, get the Margit Shackle. You could actually, you could probably go Blood Flame Blade with Wild Strikes, immediately Margit Shackle, and that would probably kill it in like one or two of that. Yeah, I reckon so. Here's another one of the Harpy enemies, like with the Treasury Nobles. They drop a big golden rune when killed. Make sure to grab it. Um. And we got two there because there was also one in one of the craters. Uh, that will not drop again once it has dropped once. That's it. There's no need to come here and farm it. Some rainbow stones. And I think this will be the last item before we yeah. walk back to the grace we were at. There's fucking nothing in this area. Like, it's barren. Although there are a bunch of bosses. And I think that's what we're heading for next. Yes, yes. There's uh, two bosses coming up. Um, that are very doable now with the Great Stars, especially. Yeah, for sure, for sure. The, these were things we struggled with. Well, I say struggled. They were things we had to really plan and prep for earlier yeah. in the guide. At this point, we don't really have to do that anymore. We also picked up 8 Mushroom at that encampment. That was pretty cool. Which will Useful. actually be vaguely relevant eventually. Um, so, I think we grabbed... It was either a golden rune or a smith and stone. Um, yeah, that was a golden thing. rune, because I remember being annoyed about having to go out of our way to get it. Yeah, they had to put something there. <laughs> Got to draw Space a space piece. Yeah, literally, literally. Uh, smith and stone five, that's nice, although we are on to smith and stone sevens at this point. So, there's some skeletons in this area. Uh, I guess I'll try and mention. So, those are skeletal bandits specifically. And they will drop the bandit's curved sword. So that's uh, that's nice that we can show that off. Get a full view of the uh, reanimation animation there. I think actually one had a shield, so that's a skeletal soldier. I think the one with the cape is a soldier. And that has the, yeah, uh, that's right. the Sun Realm shield. So, we are setting it to night time. And we are making sure that... I don't. Do we do the bell bearing first? I think we do. Yeah, it would make sense. Uh, the bell bearing hunter spawns at this merchant shack. Um, as you can see, there is a merchant. I believe he sells a few armor perfume sets, bottle. a cookbook, and a perfume bottle. Um, We've got the sentry's well torch. The, yeah, the sentry's torch was the tool we would have used to reveal the invisible black knife assassin in the cave on the big pond in the first part of Altus. Yes, um, yes. But we didn't need that because, frankly, the spirit summons we have can just kill it for you. No, I think um, we also didn't buy the cookbook that that merchant was holding. I'm not sure. It, it, to me, it looked like we didn't. Make sure you buy the cookbook. He also sells the... 
Yeah, he has a cookbook yeah. down yeah. at the bottom. He also sells the Distinguished Great Shield, which is one of the better Great Shield options in the game. Um, it's very resistant, has very good stability. As you can see, though, we're about to fight a death bird. And we're about to fuck it up. Uh, obviously, you could... Uh, Sacred Blade is enough. You really don't need anything more than that. Uh, but if you really wanted to max out your damage, you could put on the Sacred Scorpion Charm, and you could put on the Increase Holy Damage um, tier for your Physic Flask. Yeah. And we actually got an upgrade to an item that I've been waiting to get rid of for many a part now because it, the blue gold kite shield is fucking hideous and the twin bird shield is not. It looks dope. Yeah, like despite the blue gold kite shield being pretty much like the best or one of the best medium shields in the game, it's the fucking ugliest shield in the game. At this point, the Twin Bird is arguably better because it gives you the effects of both the red and blue feathered branch swords while you're at low health, which is nice. Yep. Um, and the only other one that would have been better would have been a brass shield, but since that is an enemy drop, we are not going to rely on it for the purposes of the guide. So, uh, again, just want to reiterate, Lion's Claw would be better than Ground Slam in this particular situation against this boss. And as it's night time, and then we rested at that grace, it then made the merchant go away, and thus now when we go into this shack, the um, the Bell Baron Hunter will show up. So we're just going to put on our buffs. Uh, the Physic Flask and Golden Vow should be enough, frankly. Um, but yeah, this is the strategy. You're going to go Ground Slam, you're going to go Ground Slam, and then that will put it on its knees, and then you can go for the counter. Now, if you had Lion's Claw, it would literally be the exact same. Lion's Claw, Lion's Claw, go for the counter. And then that is how you beat the Bell Baron Hunters. Uh, yeah, this this is it. This is the strategy. If you just get the timing down for this, the Bell Baron Hunters, particularly this one, are not going to give you any trouble. The only one that's going to give you any trouble is the one in Dragon Barrow, because that one is fucking solid. And we do indeed have our own unique strategy for that one. So we get the Medicine Peddler's Bell Baron for that. And uh, yeah, that's it for those two bosses. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. The Medicine Peddler's Bell Bearing is actually quite a useful one. It makes the Twin Maiden Husks able to sell, I think, Preserving, Staunching, Clarifying, and Thawfrost Boluses. That is I good being able to buy boluses, yeah. It is nice, because it means that if you don't have access to something like Flame Cleanse Me, you still have a tool to remove poison. Um, if you don't have access to... Um, I think it's Alacrity, is the sorcery that gets rid of madness and sleep. You now have the ability to do that. Not that it'll come up very often, but you do if you need it. So, oddly enough there, we picked up a couple of Crystal, crystal Tears, and then there's also an Omen and a bunch of commoner enemies around that uh, air tree for some reason. Uh, so as we... So there's some wandering nobles. Uh, we have talked about those drops before. Uh, I really cannot be arsed repeating myself again when it comes to those things because the list of the drops is kind of extensive. But uh, yeah, we're just going to grab the items that are kind of scattered about here, avoiding getting shot off the golems. The golems can drop the bow or the axe, depending on its wielding. wielding uh, the golem... The, the Golem Great Bow and the Golem Axe, specifically. Um, and now we're just heading Golem's down to this halberd. Kinda... Is it always um, a halberd? Okay. It's not actually a halberd or an axe. It's technically a colossal weapon, but it's called the Golem's Halberd. Noted. So now we're going to do Dung Eater's quest, and this is Bogger. So when you come here, you're going to speak to him about Dung Eater, obviously. Then um, just buy some crab claws off him, I suppose. And uh, grab this golden rune. And yeah, that's now, it, we do... actually. We just need to speak to him just now. We come back later to fight the Yeah, dungeon. I was going to say, yeah. do we do that now, or do we actually progress on to the two dungeons that are hidden in this little valley here? Yeah, we're going to the dungeons. Now, these two dungeons are actually some of the harder ones in the game. Uh, you actually get some pretty good stuff out of one of them, so we're definitely going to do that. Um, and there's also a cool technique, actually, for doing the, the Hero's Grave dungeon. Uh, so hopefully... I mean, it's a pretty well-known technique at this point, but yeah, hopefully you'll be... Um, if you don't know about it, it'll help you. 
help you massively because without that technique, this one is, I think, probably the trickiest hero's grave in the game. Yeah, I think probably. Yeah, it's, it's such a ungodly pain in the ass. So there is a statue that needs broken, so we need to aggro this fucking rune bear. Because the normal bear isn't good enough to break it. There we go. So now that it's broken, we're going to attempt if Torrent fucking cooperates. Oh, these things can turn on a fucking dime. I know, and we cannot. So there is two smith and stone sticks out of that, which is actually useful. Yeah, it's a great pickup at this stage, because I think we were only missing a couple to be able to upgrade the Great Stars even further, which is nice. So this is Azuria's Hero, Azuria's Hero, Azuria Hero's Grave, Jesus Christ. Oriza. Shut up. <laughs> so we're putting um, Sacred Blade on a Katana, so this must mean that this is a skeleton uh, infested area, which it is, uh, because obviously Sacred Blade great against the skeletons and at the end of this um, dungeon there is a boss that we are going to be using the rot turret technique on we've got some souls we're going to level up if you've got any spare souls level up before continuing i guess and then we're going to be on our merry way now this particular uh, hero's grave has quite a tricky boss at the end of it um, so that's why we're going to be using rot turret so we picked up the golden epitaph out of that room. Which is a... Golden epitaph is actually not a bad weapon at all, but it really only has one real purpose, which is killing skeletons and deathbirds. It does a ton of holy damage. Um, so it's, it's your go-to tool for doing that if you uh, don't have access to Sacred Blade. I mean, you pick Sacred Blade up in Limgrave, so it's really not an issue to get. Yeah, you're going to have access to Sacred Blade. Yeah, the Golden Epitaph is especially good at it. And since it's a straight sword, it's fast. It can be paired with other straight swords like the Coded Sword that we will be picking up in a future part, both of which deal tons of holy damage. So if you really want Deathbirds to die, that is a decent strategy for getting rid of them. Now you see so in that we're encountering a lot of Basilisks. At this stage, the Beast Repellent Torch might have actually come in really handy. Yeah, that's true. If you have the Beast Repellent Torch, which you should, if you've been following the guide, you can break that out and that will um, stop the Basilisks from attacking. We just forgot about it in this part. But if the Basilisks are being annoying, then do that. Now, where we are standing, what you want to do is use Margit's Shackle. Because as we know, Margit's Shackle can activate traps. So by using Margit's Shackle, it activates a trap in this area that raises some th something that causes all of these uh, chariots to immediately die. So where we're standing, if you just hit Margaret Shackle, all these fucking chariots will explode or crash or whatever the fuck. And as a result, it will drop the, um, the tree sentinel armor, which is actually the best thing that we have just now. And it looks pretty fucking good. So, yeah, that's, that's the big tip. Because otherwise you need to like manually avoid these fucking things like like real traffic or whatever the fuck. And um, as we know, by school, you shouldn't go play in traffic. But what you should do is, um, you know, commit like an act of terrorism that causes all the traffic to crash, I suppose. I guess that's the lesson we learned here. Yeah, yeah. And um, terrorism is preferable to uh, road traffic accidents. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, we just dropped off the edge here onto these beams. Should be fairly straightforward to see what we're doing here. And now we're going to head over to this section. Again, more basilisks. So, again, the Beast Repellent Torch. I just forgot about it. Um, the basilisks in this area aren't the biggest issue, so it wasn't really necessary, I suppose. But still, they could be annoying, and the Beast Repellent Torch will stop them being annoying. So we also picked up the Vul Vulgar Militia Ashes there. Uh, they're actually really good. I think you get three of them, and they inflict bleed. So they're almost theoretically an upgrade to the imps. They're just not quite as maneuverable as the imps. They have a bit more health, but they can't dodge attacks as effectively. They probably don't have ranged either. Uh, they do have a ranged attack. They throw that little... Um... 
you know, the sort of ball on the tree and the bolus. Oh, cool. And they can throw that at enemies. It doesn't do a ton of damage, but it might grab their attention from a long range, which is really what you'd want them to use it for anyway. Bang! As you can see, Prayerful Strike putting us up to full health there. Yeah. <laughs> God, so, that yeah, was so good. Now we're just heading down to the, the very bottom of this bit. And, I mean, this this bit would have been so much more annoying if it isn't for that Margit Shackle tip. So, genuinely, just buying the Margit Shackle for 5,000 gold off patches at this point is just the tip of the century. It has come in handy in multiple dungeons as well, not just this one, so... Yeah, so, I mean, this is an example of why it's really good as well, because it allows you to just activate this trap grab the item and then be on your merry way again. It's very, very handy. Cool and a based shackle pill. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think I think that's it for just this bit, right? There is oh, no. this little section down here and I think there's an omen enemy guarding a yes, talisman. I want to say it's the crucible feather talisman. This is that, that weird hooded omen. Yeah, the ones with the hoods can actually inflict death light on you. So, um, careful. Watch out for that. Yeah, keep in. The, you know what? In this cave, just keep your preserving boluses to hand. So, if you feel like a it's a great example, so that was the crystal feather talisman, and I just want to show that was a cool example of. Oh, we stunned the omen. Oh, do we want some health back? Cool. Bang! Prayerful strike. Free heal, baby. <laughs> the utility. The damage, the poise, it, it it's incredible. Yeah. Take that up, put it on a great stars, use it forever. Oh, nope. What does the Crucible Feather Talisman do? Uh, I believe the Crucible Feather is similar to the Carthus Milk Ring from Dark, Dark Souls 3. I think it gives you more invincibility frames on your roll, but makes you take increased damage if you do get hit. Cool. Uh, as you, again, you're just seeing Margaret Shackle putting in uh, yet more work. Again, for whatever for whatever reason, like I went into the the inventory being like, oh, I need to use the Margaret Shackle to lower that, and I'm like, wait, what the, what the fuck am I talking about? You just hit it to lower it. <laughs> <laughs> you were over prepared. <laughs> yeah, I felt so stupid. I was like, wait, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> so now we can just head straight to the boss. So a hero's grave that would have been a colossal pain in the ass uh, has been made uh, very smooth via Margaret and a shackle, and I hope to fucking god. They do not patch that out. I don't <laughs> think there's any way they can because of the way that Margaret Shackle's programmed. So you can program what, anything you want. Like they can. What it's, if they just? I guess they could, but what it's doing is searching the environment for entities it can interact with. Okay, but now we're going to do the boss, and I know that I said that we were going to do the rot turret technique, but actually I slightly lied, except I didn't. So we're going to do the prayerful strike turret. So we're going to equip the Rot Turret setup, which is the Royal Remains armor set, the Blessed Jew Talisman, the Icon Shield. But what we're going to do is we're going to have one Great Stars with Prayerful Strike in our right hand. And when we summon the Mimic tier, all it can do is attack, block with the Great Shield, attack with the, um, with the Great Stars, and then spam Prayerful Strike. Now you need to understand that just a normal Mimic tier with mostly any other setup is going to get absolutely fucking ruined by these guys. But when it has all this health regen shit, uh, you'll notice multiple times in this fight, the Mimic tier gets its ass handed to it and then it just gets off one prayerful strike and it's back up to full health. And uh, this is fantastic. I mean, this technique is insane because it means that for bosses like this, the Mimic tier can be an endless distraction, which you can see it is. When we tried to use the rot turret, it as much as it was able to get a rot off, it just got it just got completely shagged by the crucible knight way too much. So, yeah, this is a really really good technique. Now, when it comes to fighting the crucible knights itself, it just turns out that prayerful strike is actually incredibly good at fighting against them uh, because you're able to like time your prayerful strike quite well to be able to attack through its attacks or like between its attacks, and then you can get off your own hit, and then heal back up to full. Um, honestly, the technique is fantastic. Uh, even when you hit the shield, you get all your health back. So you can just spam Prayerful Strike, and this is now the um, the accepted canon for Gay for Games guides on how to beat Crucible Knights. It is spam Prayerful Strike at the Crucible Knight until it's dead. 
Yeah, so, um, like, a little bit more about the utility of Rifle Strike here. Um, you've seen it do that Vortex attack a couple of times. It's called Odo versus Vortex. It's the Ash of War of the weapon this boss drops. Um, Prayerful Strike can interrupt it. Prayerful Strike is not interrupted by the little rock ground slam thing it does where it stomps its foot. It's not interrupted by the first swing of the tail swipe. It's not interrupted by a single normal hit. But as you can see, the Mimic held his own for long enough for us to kill Odovis, and now the next one's just a joke. This is just one Crucible Knight. We can do this. We've done it multiple times. See, yes. it, we weren't staggered out of it by the ground slam. Um, this is also the easier Crucible Knight to take care of because it doesn't have the shield, so it can't block any of our prayerful strikes, so it's always going to stagger it. Unless it does that, in which case, yeah. This... Yeah. <laughs> this but is think... the situation where you want to keep a couple of Crimson Flasks because we yes. wouldn't have had an opportunity to heal there. That would have cost us the fight. But instead, we got that Crimson Flask off, and now we can really just finish the fight normally. You don't have to spam Prayerful Strikes once you've got um, a single Crucible Knight on its own. This isn't now, too big a deal. If you have your own techniques for fighting these guys, by all means stick them in the comment section, uh, particularly if you think it's better than this uh, technique. But I think you will, you will agree that if you were to summon the Mimic tier, they are absolutely not lasting longer against this particular boss than with this strategy. Uh, and for no our shot. efforts, we We've got given the Crucible. It... Oh, go on. We've given it so much health regen that there is no way you're making the Mimic survive longer than that. Nah. Short nah, of no taking way. the Crucible Knight's attention and giving it great heal. The... No. Not, no shot. Not a chance. Now, granted what you could have done is uh, go into that fight the mimic tier, like you summon the mimic tier using the um, the prayerful strike spam like we were doing and then you could indeed use your own rot breath as well if you wanted to that is a, that's a solid technique uh, the current canon for cheese methods for that boss is to just spam rot breath get them both rotted and then keep running away until they both die so you could combine that technique with the mimic tier uh, which certainly would be perfectly all well and good, but we did want to show off how good Prayerful Strike is against that boss. So we've entered the Oriza side tomb. This is directly opposite the Oriza hero's grave. It's behind where the room bear was, uh, was that we used to break the statue open just outside. And this one's kind of confusing. So you'll see a bunch of these living jars wandering around. Uh, some glove wart to pick up, as with every catacomb. Um, but you'll notice... A series of chests each of which is a transporter trap now you can think of this dungeon as having three layers we were just in layer one and we have transported to layer two and layers two and three are almost identical which is designed to trip you up so as we've said the objective in this area is to grab all the items in layer two all the items in layer three pull the lever which is just above us here in layer two and then go fight the boss back in layer one. I want you to pay close attention to this prison cell. This is going to be kind of an anchor point. And once we take the transporter trap at the end of this room, it is going to put us into the prison cell that we were just looking at here on layer two. And that'll be the first thing we clear out. Taking care of the imps as, uh, as we've said, uh, the guard counter is your best technique here. When you enter this transporter trap and you're taken to the prison of layer 2, there are going to be a couple of great jars in here. It's not that big a threat, but there are some good items in this dungeon. Um, in the whole dungeon, actually, there's a couple of ritual parts, a couple of crack parts, um, a cookbook. It's it's all good stuff. Um, yeah, definitely. So it's well worth coming here. Like if you're in any way like pot-focused, for sure, I think there's four cracked pots in this dungeon, which is insane by itself so we've got perfumous cookbook two crack pots it's all pretty good but this part is a dead end so taking this teleporter trap takes us back to the end of that corridor that we're just in so we're still in layer two see there's the guy we just killed but now we're going to head down to this little bit here hit that wall <laughs> um and now uh, avoid this trap obviously now, this teleporter trap should be taken as the first time to layer 3. Yeah, that's right. So, it's going to put us on the balcony where an imp was throwing um, 
magic parts at us, or at least it's going to put you where you think the imp was throwing magic parts at you. But in fact, yes. when you follow this around, you come to realize that you're actually on layer three because the lever is missing. It's been replaced by an imp. Also, another way of noticing that you're on a different layer is under the stairs, uh, there is another glove wart and an imp. But we've already killed this imp and got this glove wart. Yeah, it is It is a bit of a mindfuck, this entire um, cave here. So if you think about it, we're heading back to where the entrance chest should be. But as you can see, that's also missing because we're no longer in layer two. We are now in layer three. Just want to make that explicitly clear. Yeah. But we get a retro Anytime pot. Trans yeah, exactly. That's a great pickup. Um, some of the most powerful consumables in the game are ritual pots. So freezing pots and rot pots are both ritual pot consumables. So um, very, very useful to have. Now we're taking the path as if we were in layer two. But we are not. We are in layer three. Um, we are we are in layer three currently, and where we are heading is to the balcony of layer two, right here. Yes, as you can see, the imps are back. There's your signal that you've now transitioned layers because we hadn't fought these ones, or we had to fought these ones in layer three. But you will notice having the jail. The big pots aren't there, and there's also no glove wart because there was no glove wart for us to pick up. But the layer three jail had some glove wart, which we'll get later. Now, heading up this ladder, this takes us to another teleporter chest that takes us to a sort of layer four, I guess. Um, it takes us to um, an identical looking part of the entrance, like the very, very like entrance part of this level, but just this is a a secret level four bit that just don't really pay attention to it too much because you only come here once yada yada yeah this is just grab this item and then immediately leave it don't worry about this as a layer quote unquote yeah. really another we're ritual on pot. two and three yeah now, even better bearing in mind we were teleported from layer three to the balcony of layer two and now if we jump out that uh that little window we are now back in layer three. Correct. Yes. So this time, when we head in this direction, we are going to take the other transporter trap. This one here. And this, if I'm not mistaken, should put us in the prison of layer three. Yes, it should do. And there's the glove wart that you saw earlier. So yeah, this definitely can fuck you up if you're not aware of what it is that you're doing. There's also, uh, there's a, no, there's the two cracked pots I was talking about. So that's four cracked pots all in just in this one, um, this one tomb. It's pretty, really, really, really good. Now there's also, um, another tomb later in the game, which is three identical areas. And that one's really going to fuck you up. Aye. Um, but this ladder takes you from the prison of layer 3 all the way to the lever back in layer 2. Yes. So you come here, you pull this, then you head back to the entrance of layer 2 where the transporter trap we originally came through all and in the layer way back three, at the start. In layer 3, this was the big pot with the ritual pot, but we are in layer 2, so this takes us back to layer 1. So, stated goal achieved, we've grabbed every item in layers 2 and 3, and we're back in layer 1, ready to go tackle the boss. But first, I reckon we'll be probably sitting at a grace and getting ready for it. You absolutely don't have to, though, because it is just a Grave Warden duelist. Oh, apparently I'm aware of that, and we're just going to kick its fucking teeth in. This one is funny, though. It is funny. Is it? <laughs> yeah. What, just he has the a bunch footage? Of... No, he has a bunch of pots. <laughs> oh. He's got a bunch of backup. Look at him and his backup dancers. Oh, look at look at me and my backup dancer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, jumping L1s, prayerful strike. There's, lift, there's almost no going wrong. Lion's Claw is so impossibly fucked against this guy. 
But um, <laughs> fucking hell, prayerful strike is so good. I love that the mimic decided to take out the real threat and go for the jars instead of fighting <laughs> yeah. a big dude with two hammers. That's spectacular. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he swoops in at the last minute like fucking Batman. Everybody gets one. What? Pure steel. I can't believe we get an assist. That's fucked up. <laughs> After all that work. <laughs> Your reward for doing that, by the way, is the Soul Jars of Fortune, the best named Spirit Ash in the game. Such um, a good pun. Summons a bunch of the uh, warrior jars and they explode when killed. Um, it's it's fun. It's not great, but it's fun. So yeah, there is the Azuria side turn. Should probably mention, bear in mind that the imps can drop the fort hatch at the fort greatsword, the imp head cat, the imp head fang, imp head long tongue, imp head wolf, smoldered butterflies, glintstone fireflies, foggolins, mushrooms, and various smith and stones depending where you are in the game. Ah, <sighs> to get that out of the way. <laughs> Lovely. Headed up this spirit spring here. Um, I think we've already ridden this up once. Uh, um, but you take yes. it again, and we are prepped to fight the next, the next fucking roadblock in this area, which is this bad boy, the Draconic Tree Sentinel. I will mention before we get into the meat, meat and potatoes of it, that you can in fact sneak behind this and poison it to death, as we did with the Falling Star Beast, as you could do with the Tree Sentinels um, earlier on in Altus. But that's boring and not prayerful strike build. Correct. Uh, now, something we discovered again, uh, so specifically the, the Tree Sentinel in Farm Azula, uh, Lion's Claw is so impossibly fucked against this guy that it, you just basically just keep him staggered constantly. Um, again, Prayerful Strike is very, very good. Uh, Lion's Claw, also very, very good. You plus an Mimic Tear doing that, there's kind of nothing that this guy can really do to you. <laughs> As you can see, he stole a kill again! Bastard! Who assists? God, imagine. Imagine this guy being on your team. I know, Fucking I know. Glory hound. Partly we were on his team. Yeah. <laughs> we are the backup. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much it for the Draconic Tree Sentinel. If you can hit it hard enough, it's just going to stagger. Uh, that if Personally, never had an issue with the boss, so it's quite hard to really give any specific advice for it. Just hit the fucking thing with the great stars like you kind of can't go wrong to be honest i will say the reason um gravel stones the reason Worth uh, it. not in any way shape or form but the reason people struggle with the draconic tree sentinel is because he hits like a fucking truck um if you're not adequately equipped you don't have good armor you don't have prayerful strike you don't have the great stars you don't have the mimic um he can be kind of a pain in the ass, which is why I wanted to mention that you can poison it to death, if you sure, are struggling. Sure. Um, otherwise, though, he's not too hard to deal with, especially when you're as well geared as we are. Particularly, I mean, something to really bear in mind is because we have larval tiers, if you are struggling, there's absolutely nothing wrong with just particularly now we've got the bell barons, just re into this build exactly, and again, you can just spam Lion's Claw, you and the Mimic, into the Draconic Tree Sentinel, and that will that will kill it quite effectively. Um, there's nothing wrong with respecking into this build, specifically because, honestly, the Great Stars are great, but they're also a ton of fun because of the utility of all the different Ashes of War you can put on it that just makes things so much easier. So now, after all that, we are finally in Lindell, and... Uh, Melina shows up to chat for a little bit. We can level up using what souls we've got. There's Bok. We'll speak to him in the next part. Um, but now we're just going to head back to the round table hold and upgrade as much as we can. We are so very well leveraged at this point for Lindell. Hopefully you're at a similar level and similarly well equipped. Um, but we need a bit more Smith and Stone 7s uh, to upgrade. To upgrade this, the, the great stars. Because we want to upgrade one fully uh, and then start upgrading the next one. Or like Honestly, not per level. Not that we need the fucking damage at this point. I mean, to be honest, I think the great stars at their current level could probably carry you through the rest of the game. But with probably. that, 
leveling up and that'll be it for part number and okay there we go that's capital outskirts done join us in part 29 where we're going to be doing lindell royal capital now other than liking and subscribing you can follow us on twitter you can also follow us on twitch where we will be streaming once the dlc is out and if you're feeling especially generous you can sling us some cash on patreon if you're so inclined but the best thing you can do is just comment anything just comment anything go on anything two seconds go on Anyway, catch you in the next part.